city, and so we're very thankful for them. You are in the first through fourth grade this morning. I've got two options for you. The first is you can come on down and join our children's staff to my left for an elementary message. And uh, parents, if you have uh, not checked in your child yet for that, um, someone is out in the lobby to assist you with that. Uh, The second option is that you can stay right here in the sanctuary. We have a, a children's bulletin and a sermon quiz for you if you'd like to do that. You can find those in the lobby as well. And if you're sitting at the end of your row, uh, you might notice a little black notebook uh, in front of you or next to you. Uh, Would you fill that out uh, and pass it down your row? Uh, It's just one of the things that we do to help a a big church feel a little bit smaller. Well, I've got two key announcements for us this morning that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, The first one is that I want to invite you to a time of corporate and individual prayer uh, this Tuesday night, January 23rd. Um, This is a time that we have set aside to pray for uh, our church, for our people, for our city. Um, We would love for you to join us. It's going to be here at CPC Central in the gathering room uh, from 6.30 to 7.30. Again, that's this Tuesday night. It's going to be a beautiful exercise in worship, and we hope that you will join us for that. Um, The second announcement is a reminder that our Connect groups are restarting at both church locations. So if you don't know, our Connect groups meet in homes around Nashville, uh, and they can be really instrumental in helping you to identify the close friends that you might uh, develop inside of our church. And I know uh, for Sarah and me, um, we absolutely love our Connect group. Uh, We have made some amazing friends, and we've just really enjoyed getting to sort of do life together with them and encourage each other and pray together and laugh together and all these things. And so if you are not a part of a Connect group, we would love for you to think about joining one. Now's the time to do that. Um, If you're already a part of a Connect group, uh, you don't need to re-register, but if you would like to register, information is on uh, the CPC website, and it's also in your bulletin today. Um, With that, I'd like to invite Campbell Butler once again to come up and read this morning's scripture. Today's scripture reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down, sorry, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much for reading that wonderful passage of scripture. Wonderfully depressing. (laughs) Really honest about it, I think that's what it is. And I am so glad that passages such as that books such as Ecclesiastes and also Song of Songs bring to life um, the real hard-hitting realities of life for us. So last week, uh, Pastor Scott started this uh, new sermon series in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is really focusing on much of life under the sun being about vapor and meaningless and vanity And if you're actually thinking through what I'm saying, then you might rightly conclude that there is no meaning to this exercise called sermon, since all is meaningless vapor anyway, then I'm tempted to say that let's just all go home. But that'll create a bit of a PR mayhem in our church. may never be asked to preach again, so I feel we have to fill our time with something, however vaporish and senseless. So if that's okay, let's pray as we look to the Lord. Gracious God, all kidding aside, we come to realize that in different moments, we are reminded of how senseless and vaporish and vain our life's pursuit may be, if done without you and apart from you. 
even with you and within you, oftentimes we feel that because you have designed it for us to desire you above all. So as we look to your word now, I pray especially for my friends who are in elementary, middle, and high school that this message will somehow resonate with them in their own pursuit of life and joy and meaning. May that mean something to them too, Lord, not only for them but for all of us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So as we said earlier, if we're really honest, sometime in our lives we feel that way. What is this for? What on earth, what the heck, what the belief am I doing here, and what have I done all of these things for? Such, I think, are inescapable conclusions about life. Again, however provisional or even however ultimately misguided they might be. Or are they? Do you feel empty? Do you feel that, what am I doing all of these things for? What have I accomplished? Some may conclude that it is from the devil. Some may conclude that, therefore, life is meaningless. Others may conclude that God has instilled it within us so that in our kind of musings and struggles, we'll somehow seek after God. And I think the answer is actually kind of both. And we'll unpack how that can be the case. So I think it was Wednesday of this week past. Uh, we have had a lot of snow and kind of uncharacteristic of this part of the country, but there you have it. So um, and it was, I was coming home from school and I was stopped at this traffic light and it was very, very cold outside. And to my left and one car in front of me, I see a guy had his uh, moonroof open. And you know, smoke was coming out of his dual exhaust and all of that. And you know what he was doing? He was also, the reason why he had his uh, moonroof open was because he was vaping. It was a, that's the term, right? Vaping, right? Kind of smoking. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. So, and it was really cool. It looked really cool. It looked like he was, it was some kind of dragon exhaling or something because the smoke was really concentrated, just it came out. And I was like, whoa, what is that? And, and he kept doing that, the long line. And I was like totally mesmerized. And it never occurred to me that, it didn't occur to me I should try to do that or something like that, but I was just kind of like sitting there, wow, that's pretty interesting because I never really seen anyone like vape through his moonroof and then I'm kind of like limited in my life experience, I guess, kind of being ivory tower professor that I am, I don't know, but so as cool as that might have been or as dragon-esque as that might have looked, it disappeared into the frigid wintry air within split seconds. As we begin today's sermon, I want you to think about that. If you've seen people vape, it just kind of, it's really high concentration of smoke that comes out and like you see it very clearly and bam, it's gone. So as we begin today's sermon, let's make a note of something as Pastor Scott mentioned last Sunday as well. Some of us read the NIV, which is a, I think a great, great translation. But uh, for official purposes here at our church, we use the English Standard Version, ESV. And the ESV renders the, ver the word um, that is used in the NIV as meaningless as vanity. And I think that's actually closer to the, the, the word, uh, the Hebrew word hebel, that we'll look at more intensely throughout our sermon today. Um, and so which way is it, we might ask? We want to look at this word and do a bit of a, a word study, or the nerdy word for that is a lexical study meaning something like this. We're going to actually start in Ecclesiastes, but we're going to traverse back to Genesis chapter 3 and 4. We're going to move forward to Romans chapter 8 and then end with Hebrews chapter 12. So in other words, we're going to kind of follow through what these words have meant throughout uh, the Bible, both in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible as well as in the New Testament, and through it all, hopefully, and that's my greatest hope, that we'll catch a glimpse of what God has in mind in giving us this kind of a, a cross-shaped kind of vacuum in our hearts. And through it all, we may look to God for deep satisfaction that only God can provide. So, um, so I think that's the point. And the word that I've used there, uh, the, the Hebrew word is hebel, okay? And uh, what I would call vaping through millennia. We see this word vanity, vapor, meaninglessness in verse 2 five times. 
And the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer uses it 29 more times. So some total, 34 times, the writer says, life is vapor, meaningless, vanity, however we render it. So it seems to me, does it not you, that that might be an important word for this writer. Let me kind of compare it this way. In Abram Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address, do you know which words were most frequently repeated? Among others, there are three words that got repeated a lot. The word we, as a sense of bringing a collective sense of national identity, President Lincoln used that term 10 times. He used the word here, denoting where he was standing at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, in the rubble and rubble of the Civil War and the wreckage of nation divided eight times, and used the word dedicate as a way of signifying what he was about to do, dedicating our haunted memories of the past and the hallowed ground of the present into the bright future tomorrow that he was looking for, dedicating our life, past, present, and future into our collective consciousness. So we 10 times, here eight, to eight, eight times, dedicate six times. Another very well-known speech in our uh, generation or a generation ago is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech. The most frequently used words there were freedom, which was used 20 times, dream used 11 times, justice and injustice 10 times. So, freedom is used 20 times in I Have a Dream speech. In the Gettysburg Address, we is used 10 times. So you can kind of reckon that if the word vanity or vapor or meaningless is used 34 times in our book, then we can see that it is quite important for the writer. Then the question becomes, where else was it used? We will see that it is quite, uh, used quite early in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, and to do that, let's look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 comes right at the heels of the story of human fall. In Adam and Eve's rebellion against God, in their choice, exercising their free will to walk away from God, what ended up happening to them is a, there is a fallenness and darkness sets in and mutual acrimony and blame shifting happens. And in chapter 4, we find Adam and Eve having... Uh, come together as a husband and wife, and they are now having children. And before that, as part of the kind of pronouncement of curse as well as pronouncement of promise and the gospel message, God said to the serpent, he is a, a symbolism for all that which is against shalom of God, he says, you know what, I'm going to put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and the, your seed and the seed of the woman. And what's going to happen to you is you're going to have this kind of big-time hostility, and this seed of the woman is going to strike your head, and you will manage to strike his heel. So there is an enmity. But Eve understood that with the birth of this seed, meaning her child, there is going to be some resolution, a deadly blow given to the seed of the serpent. So if you were to look at Genesis chapter 4 in the first verse, it says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain, or the Hebrew is Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. The word Cain or Cain means acquire. That means, okay, with God's help, I have acquired this child. And you know what she's hoping? She's hoping that he, this child who's going to grow up bigger and bigger, he's going to strike the serpent's head. But as we will see, that's not at all the head that he managed to strike, although a head he does indeed strike later on. The, and then furthermore, it says in verse 2, later she gave birth to his brother Abel. The Hebrew word there is Habel. Same word that is used in Ecclesiastes 1-2. Think about that. You have two kids, and names mean something, right? And we know that. How, how do we know it? Every time a baby is baptized, what happens? Either uh, Pastor Todd Tello or Pastor David Filson would you know, hold their babies and do what they do so well, in you know, a wedding this floor and all that. But more than that, they would ask, what is the child's name? And then they often explain to us the meaning of the name. So names always mean something. 
So Cain's name meant that, you know, with God's help, I have gotten a son. But Abel means vapor. I mean, imagine that. Imagine your name is vapor. Imagine your name is meaningless. Imagine your name is vanity. So compared to the older child, the second child, and that's all it says. In verse 2 it says, now she gave birth to his brother Abel. That's it. Nothing else is spoken about Abel. And so we come to this point. What happens in the end? Mother's dream is crushed. The older one does not quite turn out to be the redeemer at all. And the younger son is killed by her own older son. Talk about tragedy. Talk about vaporish, senseless death. We as a congregation are aware of events like that within and without. We care to look around. We have so many stories of senseless tragedies among us. Yet, Abel was the righteous one. He offered the right sacrifice to God. And the surviving brother was a most wicked, wicked man. So from the very first few pages of the Jewish scripture or Christian Old Testament, we see that life looks as if at its core we find much vapor. Are you with me? In the very fourth chapter of Genesis, you have a man who is dying a senseless death, a man who was righteous, a man who was faithful, yet he does not have God coming to him and saying something. God speaks to Cain and not Abel. It seems senseless. It seems like it's vapor. It seems it's a meaningless tragedy indeed. Here one day, gone the next. I want you to grapple with that. I want you to grapple with the fact that in the very first few pages of Scripture, that's the drama of humanity. That is the, the stuff that we find ourselves in. Who, what's that guy's name? Young, young people, help me out. Pharrell Williams, is that the guy's name? Right? He has a song called what? Happy. And I like that song because that helps me to escape from this pressing reality of life sometimes. But Scripture will not give us a rosy picture of reality. Scripture presents to us life as it is under the sun. And in the midst of all of that, in our cacophonous tragedies, and life sometimes, more often than not, don't add up and don't make sense, God shows up. A French Catholic existentialist writer named George Bernanus said something truly helpful, at least for me, and I want to quote him here. In order to be prepared to hope in what does not deceive, we must first lose hope in everything that deceives. Again, in order to be prepared to hope that in what that does not deceive, we must first lose hope in everything that deceives. Health could be deceiving. Youth, I can tell you most emphatically, as I turned 50 last year, can be deceiving and fleeting. I just remember like it was yesterday when I was 15 or 18, I was a lot stronger, a lot faster, and I'm anything but that now. Deceit of youth, wealth, prosperity, fame, prominence, whatever it may be, your prowess, those things can come and go, in fact, do come and go. So then we must first lose hope in everything that deceives. So in addition to Genesis, we, we see this word used in Romans chapter 8, except that we have to do a bit of a language transfer. So you knew that most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? And then most of the New Testament was written in Greek. So um, New Testament was written in Greek. So there was a thing called the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Okay? So stay with me, please. In Genesis 3 and Romans 8, we see a connection that has to do with the fall and the consequence of human fallenness or our rebellion against God. What do I mean by that? In Romans 8.20, the Apostle Paul writes, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. The word here for futility that is used is matayotes, that means vanity or emptiness or futility or vapor. Guess what? When these um, writers or interpreters did the translation work of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek, the word that they use to translate Ecclesiastes 1-2, vanity or 
vapor or meaninglessness is the same word, mataiotes. That means this, that as the writer, Kohelet or Solomon, whoever that may have been, is grappling with the meaningless or purposelessness or vanity or vapor as life of ours, the writer, the apostle Paul, uses that same word and same concept to th express to us that there is a fallenness in our creation, that even though our nature seems to be working so well and covering our ground with the snow, but that same snow could cause havoc in terms of avalanche taking away lives. The beautiful rain that you may see and experiencing among us could easily become a hurricane taking away lives. That's why the writer of Romans, the Apostle Paul says, creation has been subjected to futility or frustration or vapor-esque because there is something that has gone awry or terribly wrong, tragically wrong with our cosmos because of our human rebellion. So as a result of the fall, all of creation is subjected to vanity, futility. No matter how hard I work, instead of great harvest, the Lord said to Adam in Genesis 3:17, Cursed is the ground because of you, and thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Let me ask you a question. For which country is thistle their national flower? Somebody said it right. What is it? Scotland. That's right, Scotland. So my wife and I lived in England for four years when, we did our, when I did my graduate studies. But, you know, there's something about this, the Scottish history, you know, the, the movie um, with, uh, William, about William Wallace, uh, Braveheart. And, you know, being, uh, I was born in Korea, grew up here. But so there's being Korean and being Scott, there's a lot of connection. Because Scottish history is kind of inseparable from English history. And it seems to me as I got to learn some of my, got to know some of my Scottish friends after I got to figure out their accent, first of all, that, you know what, their story is a lot of repeated invasion and struggle for independent, you know, autonomy and, and identity. Even more recently, there had kind of this whole thing about uh, Scottish kind of going um, independent, and it didn't quite happen, and it's all back and forth, back and forth. You know, I mean, think about thistle being your national flower. To me, that's really emblematic of Scottish history. I mean, there's a lot that deep pathos that resonates with me. And in some ways, that thistle could be this emblematic kind of cosmic flower for all of humanity. Because God says thorns and thistles it will produce for you instead of bountiful harvest all the time. So this word, Matthiotes, shows up here in 1-2 of Ecclesiastes, it says tapanta matayotes, meaning all is vanity, all is frustration, all is vapor, all is meaningless. Just as creation itself has become vaporized unless someone else reorients it or redeems and recalibrates it, our life's journey will always be vaporish and vapid unless someone else redeems it. That's why the writer, again, uses this expression a lot, life under the sun. He uses that expression a number of times to show that under the sun means life lived apart from this joyful kind of relationship with God. So let's look at the rest of the chapter here. Whatever the writer, what the writer is trying to do is to show that compared to nature, which is already showing signs of vanity, futility, and vapor, human life is even more an exercise in futility and vanity, thus becoming vapor. Look at verse 4 of our text. It says, generation comes, generations go, but the earth remains forever. That means compared to human generations, there's something solid and stable and per semi-permanent permanent about earth or created order. Earth remains. And look at verse 5. It says, the sun comes and then sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Sun and wind and earth and sea, these are far more permanent than human generations that are here today, and bam, gone the next day. Verse 9, it talks about this very interesting circularity of human story. Here, where it says, what has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. What is seemingly new has already been. Today's hot item was already deemed cold yesterday. So I think a lot of us are kind of excited about not all, but, you know, a lot of us are excited about the football and NFL kind of playoff series right now. And I'm from Philadelphia. Our son was born in Boston, so excited that the Eagles and Patriots are still in, and it could be Eagles-Patriots Super Bowl. But I was talking to our son, Christian, and he's 
he likes uh, football and he likes watching it. He, play, he likes playing it on Xbox. And I was asking him about this player that I used to like a lot. So people under age 15, do you know this guy named Jeremy Shockey? Do you know Jeremy Shockey? Have you heard of him? Okay, that just, all right. You're not supposed to say that, but okay. The point is, most, a lot of people, my Christians said, you know, I never heard of Jeremy Shockey, and it's not that important. I was like, what? Jeremy Shockey's a great tight end. He played for the New York Giants, and I don't know, that just the way that he plays, I just really appreciate it. Maybe not off the field, but the way he played on the field, I really appreciate it. Jeremy Shockey was a big-time tight end for the Giants and the Saints, and I think played for one season with the Panthers. But the fact that a 13-year-old boy who was into sports said, I never heard of the guy. See, Jeremy Shockey was around just a few years ago. But he is forgotten. His shelf life after retirement means like no one really remembers. And there is that kind of odd and inescapable sense of our life story. So then the question is, how do we avoid the sense of vapor, vanity, and futility? Some have turned to God. Others have turned, turned to rock climbing. Others have turned to working harder. Others have turned to working out harder. Others have turned to sex. Others have turned to just erasing the memories of God and whatever else that may be our pleasure or the choice of avoidance of vanity and futility. For some, I guess in terms of uh, modernity in the West, it meant that erasing our memories of God. So one of the persons that really kind of encapsulates that sense is this uh, German um, atheist philosopher who has actually a lot to teach Christians about what it means to worship God in reverse. His name is Friedrich Nietzsche, and he has a story called The Parable of the Madman, published in 1882. I want to read excerpts from it for us. Have you not heard of the madman who lit a lantern, a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace, and cried incessantly, I am looking for God, I am looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has God got lost? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Has he immigrated? Thus they yelled and made fun of him. The madman jumped into the mist and pierced them with his eyes. Where is God? he cried. I will tell you. We have killed him. You and I, all of us are his murderers. But how do we do this? How can we drink up the sea? And who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from the sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of the empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns early in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God also decomposes. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? So must we not become ourselves gods simply to appear worthy of it? It has been related further that on the same day, this madman forced his way into several churches and there struck up his rest in peace God song. Let out and called into account, he said to have replied nothing but, what are these churches after all if they're not the tombs and sepulchers of God? As you travel throughout Europe in many places, many of these old churches are no longer churches of vibrant worship. They may be museums, they may be restaurants, they may be discotheques, they may turn into other places of worship. So it seems to me that we know what that is like. So some have opted to just find meaning apart from God. But I'm assuming that since you're here in this sanctuary, you have your pursuit of meaning, your pursuit of avoiding vapor and vanity has something to do with God. So I want to explain that and lead us to the final point. So as to the final point, I'd like you to consider the one whose life was in some crucial sense a vapor, a vanity, and futility. I'm thinking of the one who cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his most desperate moment of his life journey, some of his closest friends 
friends that he had for three years, and they lived together, slept in the same place, ate together, worked together for three years. Of the 12, one sold him for 30 pieces of silver, and the other 10 had run away, and only one was remaining. Think of your life and relational failure, if you want to put it that way. All must have seemed like vapor or, va or futility or complete, complete vanity. Senseless indeed. And I want you to think about this Jesus. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, 24, the writer is talking about this new covenant that God establishes through Jesus and what this Jewish man, Jesus, accomplished in the name of Yahweh and how that might be the pointer to a new understanding of God and God's mission in this world. Jesus died on the cross, and when he died, his life did seem like it was vapor that was here one day and gone the next, exercised in futility and vanity. But what the writer says in 1224 is, let us come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of who? Abel. Did you hear that? So the writer is saying, look, we are aware of the fact that there's a lot of senseless tragedy that happens. The first senseless tragedy that happened is this guy Abel who died in the hands of his own brother when he was trying to follow God and love God. And that blood of Abel speaks vengeance and justice. And you know what's that? The writer says, you know what? The blood of Jesus speaks better word than that because Jesus says, vengeance is mine because I'm going to be the one who's going to embrace the lost lot of all of humanity. I'm going to be judged in your place. In other words, what this means is this. The good news, according to Jesus, does not say, try harder and then you'll see the purpose of it all. Nor does it say, it's all stupid and jacked up and that's all it is. Life is stupid and messed up. No, the gospel according to Jesus and the God of Israel says, try harder and you might find some things fulfilling, but that won't be all. Did you hear that? So the gospel is saying something like this. Okay, you can try your best and you can find fulfillment, but you will realize there's always something missing because these missing points are pointers to the ultimate source of joy and provider of that meaning and the impossible laughter. You see, you'll still feel that vapor inside you and vanity and futility will inevitably creep in. Yes, it is stupid and jacked up. If you believe that that's all it was ever meant to be, that life as you know it under the sun is just that I got to have bigger toy, better toy, better education, better job, better home, better zip code, better whatever, and then I can say, I got it better than you. No, 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 no. That's not what it is. What the gospel of Jesus says is that I embrace futility. I embrace vapor. Indeed, I became vaporized in your place so that you won't have to find that in the end of your life's merry-go-round that it's not at all as Rolling Stones and they used to sing and perhaps continues to sing, I can't get no satisfaction. Knowing Jesus, being known by Jesus is one way to move concretely toward tackling the inevitable sense of futility in our life whatever you might say. I want to finish with this story. So about 26 years ago, um, I got to go with the senior pastor that I was serving in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, to Kenya, East Africa. And so I was so excited, and I was a young seminarian, and uh, so I was, you know, just enthused to do God's work there. And the missionary that we were working took us to the, the right at the foothills of the the Kilimanjaro Mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, and just one, one of the most spectacular scenes of life that I've ever seen. And I was, you know, this missionary introduced us to the Maasai chief, and he was introducing me, and he said, you know, and this is kind of one of those kind of poignant moments in my life of turning around. He introduced me as, oh, this is uh, Pastor Lim from America, and, and he said, um, this, uh, he went to Yale University. And you know what the Maasai chief said through translator? He said, I never heard of Yale. I don't really care. But what I want to know is, does he love Jesus? You know, there have been several turning points in my life, journey, and that was definitely one of them. Because for whatever reason, this missionary thought like, okay, if I want to emphasize something about this guy, I want to tell him that this guy went to Yale. For this Maasai chief, 
because he was kind of being introduced to Christianity. He says, no, no, wait a minute. If you're a missionary, if you're telling me what is really, really important, shouldn't it be whether this guy loves Jesus or not, whether he went to whatever school it may be? And he goes, I don't, I never heard of that school. Doesn't matter to me. But does he love Jesus? Does he know that Jesus loves him? And I want to really kind of stop right there. I want us to think about that because whatever acclaim we can accumulate for ourselves in our life journey, I am an MD, I'm a dentist, I, I, I know the superstar, I actually live next door, there's whatever music. All of those things are important. We drop names here and there and all of those things we do. But in the end, what really matters is, do you know that Jesus knows you? Do you know that Jesus was vaporized for you and for your sake and for me and for my sake? Because that's what this table is about. The table that we're going to turn to in a few minutes is a powerful symbolism and signification of God embracing us. God's radical hospitality in the face of our radical hostility to God. God says, okay, you oppose me, that's all right. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to embrace you. I'm going to make you something that far grander than you ever imagined was possible. God will erase the tears from our eyes. Erase the memories that may haunt us still. And God will say, I will continue to grow with you and nurture you so you haven't seen anything yet. With that wonderful promise, let's see the vapors and vanities of life through the lens of our God who has placed that cross-shaped hole in our, in our lives so that we feel like life is vapor. We feel like all is exercise of utility, and that's what it means to live in this already but not yet existence. But at the same time, these experiences, I pray, will be pointers to something bigger and something deeper that is the perennial and persisting presence of God. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your reminder that, yes, there is this inescapable sense of vanity and vaporesque and futility of our life's journey. Yet you do not merely point them out to us. You point out the fact that you have embraced it. You have indeed become vaporized for us. You have indeed been crucified for us and resurrected, and right now you are interceding for us and for our salvation. And we thank you that all of our life's journey are in some ways kind of silly and meaningless but only within you, you will redeem our time. That, Lord, we pray that you will make our lives count for something bigger and better and grander than ourselves, and we can only do so as we see our stories written in yours. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for that delivery. And we love you, Lord, for you have loved us first. As we come to the table, may you deepen our love for you and knowledge of you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.